New Baptist Church in Huntington. Uh, we'd love for you to join us this morning at 11 o'clock for our morning worship service, or you could join us online at uh, newbaptist.com and, and join us there. We're glad that you <laughs> that we're glad that we're able to talk to you this morning, and we're going to start out with Pete praying for us. Our Father, we're thankful once again, Lord, that we can meet in your house, Father, and we can be on the radio, Father, and be with Brother Charlie as he brings us his message this morning, Lord, that it would touch our hearts and draw people closer to you. But be with us now, Lord, and we'll not forget to praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Pete. Now, our message this morning in song is Brad Chenault. Creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice with us, we sing. Oh, praise Him, Alleluia! Thou burning sun with golden beam, thou silver moon with softer gleam. Oh, praise Him, oh, praise Him, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Let all things their Creator bless. Him in humbleness. Oh, praise Him. Alleluia. Praise, praise the Father, praise the Son, and praise the Spirit, three in one. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Hallelujah, all the redeemed washed by his blood, come and rejoice in his great love. Oh, praise him. Alleluia, Christ has defeated every sin, cast all your burdens now on Him, oh praise Him, oh praise Him, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Turn in power to reign. Heaven and earth will join to say, Oh, praise Him. Alleluia. Then who shall fall on bended knee? All creatures of our God and King. Oh, praise Him, oh, praise Him, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Amen. Good. 
Thank you so much, Brad. It's Brad Radio's debut, and we almost thought, oh no, Brad's got to get on for his first time to sing. He sings for us in church all the time, does a praise band. We really appreciate you being here this morning. Now our message this morning is Brother Charlie. We've missed Brother Charlie. Uh, he did an interim pastor at Barbersville for a while, so that's when he went away. And uh, Pastor Robin's in the 9 o'clock service this morning, so we're glad to have Brother Charlie with us. Thank you, Brad. Did good. Did good. We appreciate you. It's good to be back. Some days at my age, good to be anywhere, as a comedian would say. <laughs> oh, my. Well, God's blessed me in spite of myself. I can tell you that for sure. But again, it's, it's good to be back and serving, uh, I don't know how long, in the radio ministry. But again, I'm glad I'm here. And I uh, want to share with you, uh, I believe last week that you were um, began in Jesus' miracles, some of the miracles that Jesus uh, uh, did. It's mentioned in the Bible. I jotted some things down as I studied this week. Um, Jerry Vines, who is, uh, who is a conservative pastor, he was a pastor, I guess, uh, for the nation's third largest uh, Baptist church, Southern Baptist church. Uh, he said this, that, there are approximately 36 recorded miracles of Jesus given in the four Gospels. And um, Jesus obviously performed uh, many more than that. Uh, but in these four Gospels, there's about 36 of them that we find recorded. Uh, and when we come to the Gospel of John, um, you'll find that there are seven specific miracles that uh, we're going to look at. Um, and, and he tells us why that there are just these particular miracles that he alluded to uh, in John 20, uh, verses 30 through 31. It says, Jesus performed uh, many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so this is the singular purpose, the primary focal point that John has as he is using these particular miracles and shares them uh, with us concerning Jesus. He, he wants to accomplish exactly what he just said, and that is that you may believe in Jesus. And uh, I think that is wonderful. It's a very interesting study when you study uh, the miracles of Jesus they are kind of like road signs or pointers, if you will, um, that they, they, they point from themselves to a deeper, uh, more spiritual meaning. Uh, last Sunday, I believe um, Robin did last, uh, was here last Sunday, and uh, he looked at Jesus' first miracle, turning water into wine, uh, at the uh, wedding of Cana. Uh, and I notice again there in John 2.11, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory. That's very important. And his disciples believed on him. Again, John's trying to make a point here in illustrating the, uh, the miracles of Jesus. And obviously one of those uh, points is that we may believe in Jesus as Messiah. Well, these points are powerful, and they point to a power uh, through point to the power of of the heavenly Father through His Son Christ Jesus. It points to Christ as what I think as a a change agent. In other words, turning non-believers into believers. Um, that's very important. Uh, this morning, we're going to talk about another miracle that Jesus did in reference to water again. Um, in doing this study this past week, I was reminded um, of a story I shared at one of the churches I was pastor of. Um, and, and I love to fish. I don't know how many of y'all like to fish, but I enjoy it. Um, I'm more of a fisher man than a catcher, if you follow me. Okay. I can fish great. It's the catching that's the problem. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But I can really tell a fish story easy. 
Well, there were, there were three ministers that went out fishing one day, a, a Baptist minister and a, and a Methodist minister and, a, and a, a Catholic priest. And they rolled a few hundred yards away from the shore and they were fishing and it was getting a little warm that morning. And the Baptist minister said, you know, I'm a little thirsty. I'll go get us something to drink. And he stepped out of the water and walked over to the shore and, and got him something to drink, walked back on the water and got in the boat. And the priest, wow, what faith this man must have to be able to do that. Well, it's getting a little later, and the Methodist preacher said, you know, I'm a little thirsty again. Let me go this time. I'll pay for it. And he steps out of the boat and walks on the water, goes over to the shore, and he gets something to drink, walks back on the water, and gets in the boat. And, and the priest, my goodness, I can't believe this, you know. Well, it's getting around 1 or 2 o'clock in the evening, and it's getting really hot. And Well, the priest says, look, fellas, I'll go get a six cold ones, uh, pop, and I'll step out of the boat, and I'll be right back. And he steps out of the boat, whoom, right down he went. He's uh, flapping around in the water, not knowing what's going on. And, and the Baptist preacher turned to the Methodist preacher and said, you think we ought to tell him where the rocks are? <laughs> well, <laughs> this morning, we're going to be talking about Jesus walking on the water. And he didn't need no rocks. He walked with the power of God in him. Thank you, Jesus. He showed us something that is beyond belief and yet believable. Because again, the Bible teaches us that the disciples truly believed after they saw this. Well, let's get into it. I'm really excited about getting into the scripture this morning. In John 6, beginning with verse uh, 15, and really we'll be talking about verses uh, prior to this, 13, 14, and 15, but areas that I'm sure you've studied before. But beginning in John 6, 15, the Bible says, Jesus, knowing that they intended to come to make him king by force. Now we're talking about he just fed a whole bunch of people. We're going to talk about that in just a moment as to what all went on. So they were going to make him king by force. He withdrew again to a mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing, and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I. Don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore and were there where they were headed. Now, there's several things that went on here we want to talk about, and I'm really excited about and, and I never, as you've always heard me say before, I never have enough time to tell you all the juicy parts in what God is sharing with us. But we're going to hit a lot of the hot spots or high spots, however you want to look at it, uh, this morning. I've got about three points quickly I want to make uh, about us looking at them, the disciples and Jesus, and what he did and how he did it, uh, how it's going to help us. And number one is that we must stay focused on God's work. Uh, I think that was the beginning there as you look in John six fifteen. Jesus had just fed the 5,000. Now, now, when you look at that, it's more than 5,000 because there was also women there that wasn't counted and children there. So many more than 5,000 were being fed. You know the story about the fishes and the bread. I hope you know that miracle. Uh, if you don't, you need to go back and read that a few, a few uh, verses back. And so the people were excited. They were excited about Jesus, what all was going on. Jesus was aware of his popularity as well and the desire of the people uh, to forcibly make him the king and, and run out uh, the Romans and everybody else uh, that was there oppressing them. His reputation as a miracle worker and a teacher of God's word had spread all over the place and all over the countryside. Now, from a human perspective, we might also have encouraged Jesus to take advantage of the opportunity and uh, move on into kingship there and royalty and so on from a human standpoint, human perspective. But when you look at it from a divine perspective, uh, Jesus must focus on God's work, his Father's work that he was there to do. It was not for him to, to move up in this manner and to do this type of thing that the people wanted. 
Now, this is important because uh, it, in doing so, he would have been disobedient to his father, and uh, it would have been a disgrace uh, to all those that had been following him had he accepted what the crowd wanted to do. I mean, you think about it. Man, we'd have a king who could feed us anytime that we need food. We'd never be hungry. We'd never need water. Wow, that's awesome from a human perspective. But he did much more than that. He stayed obedient to the Father. He dispersed the crowd, and he went up on the mountaintop, the mountainside, to what I like to think, have alone time with his Father. So that's number one. We've got to stay focused on God's Word and God's work. And number two, we must go in God's direction. Now, I come to the next few verses there, 16 through 19 or so, and uh, I, Jesus went off by himself to have alone time with his Father, but his disciples were obedient, got into the boat, and you'll see in other verses, and I'll share with you here in just a few moments, uh, in a couple of other books of the uh, first four books there, that the disciples were told to get in the boat and head toward that direction that they, in Capernaum. And uh, they were obedient and did that. And the Bible says that uh, they got in the boat and they were rowing. They were doing what they were told. In other words, they were following God's direction as leadership through his son. And they were being obedient. Even then, the Bible says that there was a great tempest, a storm that came up. And if you've ever been in a boat, let me tell you, and then waves start going back and forth and back and forth, uh, it'll get your attention fast. And when it's dark, you got to think they were in uh, uh, the early mornings, anywhere from 3, 4, or 5 o'clock in the morning, dark, on a sea, with the wind blowing, with the water flashing up, the back and forth, back. Yeah, I think I'd been a little concerned, okay? Uh, I'm not much, like I said, I'm not much of a, of a catcher or a fisherman either, really, but my boat skills aren't that great either. And even at that, these people were concerned. They were being tossed from side to side. There was a lot of fear there, I believe. And uh, I, I think it also teaches us that in our life, there are storms that come up. And when we're being tossed from side to side in the darkness of life, when I say darkness, I mean not knowing what's next. Kind of like what we're in right now. Wouldn't you think? In COVID, uh, COVID-19, you know, I talked to my wife. We talk about all of what's going on. And I said, honey, I'm not going to live in fear. He don't teach me to live in fear. I'm going to do what I believe is correct. He teaches us to be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. And that's what I'm going to be. If that means wear a mask, I wear a mask. I got my little mask right here. In God we trust. <laughs> uh, and I wear that. Uh, I try to be wise in my dealings with other people. I do safe distancing and all that. I think that's important. But I'm going to live my life, and I'm not going to live it in, in, in seclusion. I'm going to share the gospel that God gives me. I think that's important. Yet, as we even see here, when we're following God's direction, stuff happens. And bad stuff happens to good people. The disciples were out there, 3, 4, 5 o'clock in the morning, trying to be obedient, rolling toward Capernaum, being tossed from side to side. The fear is rising. And then what does the Bible teach us? Oh, my goodness. It teaches us something I believe is very important. We need to be looking for Jesus, <laughs> okay? In all the storms and all the stuff that's going on, we need to be looking for his face. And sure enough, they looked down in the water, the Bible teaches me, uh, in verses 20 and 21. And this is my third point, that we must go in his presence. And we'll come to that here in just a second. They saw a ghost, the Bible says. If you look over in Matthew 14, 26, or Mark uh, 6, 49, they thought it was a ghost out there on the water. Now, folks, I'll tell you what. If I was in the dark... I'm being tossed from side to side in a boat with a whole bunch of other fellers, okay, and hoping we was going in the right direction. At 4 o'clock in the morning, and I look out in the water and I see somebody walking, I'm going to have to change my britches, okay? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm going to have to start wearing brown pants is all I can say because <laughs> I would be not just scared, I'd be panicked. I mean, I would panic, and I believe they did. 
And the Bible says, in, in, like I said, in Matthew and Mark, that they thought it was a ghost. And, and Jesus knew this. And this is what I like. It's Jesus' calming voice. Because how could they even hear him with all the water and the wind? And yet they did, didn't they? And what happened? It calmed them down. It calmed that panic down in their storm. What about our storms? Have you ever been in a storm of life, things going awry, people that you love either getting sick or dying, and you're thinking, where is God in all this? And you begin to talk to him. More importantly, you begin to listen to him. And you hear his calming voice and, and, and calms the panic in your life and in your heart and say, don't be afraid. It's me. It's Jesus. I'm here with you in this storm. I've been there. Done that. I'm there. I do that. <laughs> and that's what Jesus did. His voice, it not only had a calming effect on the fellers there, it had a calming effect on the storm. The Bible teaches me that when they had come into the presence of Jesus and he got on the boat, several things happened. And really, for me, I hear two other miracles here in these verses. One is that I hear a miracle of quietness. The storm stopped. The wind stopped. He controlled nature at that moment. Wow. To me, that's a miracle. The second uh, part of that that I believe is a miracle too, that is they were already there where they had been rowing to get. Uh, the Bible says that here we are. And, and just miraculously, they were there. So to me, I see a whole bunch of stuff here that, that God teaches us that sometimes we might be closer to the truth of where he wants us to be while we're in his presence than we realize. But we are panicked so much, we're scared so much of what's going on that we can't see what's happening where we should be and, and what we should be doing. And then his voice calms our hearts and our, our minds down and we go, oh, I was here all the time. Thank you, Jesus. Forgive me of my silliness. It's amazing how he works. Well, as Paul Harvey would say, let me get to the rest of the story. I have, as I used to do, I don't know if you remember or not, for those of you that used to listen uh, to me on the radio, but I have uh, Charlie's Practical Points to Ponder. <laughs> don't say that too fast, you'll hurt your jaw, okay? <laughs> but I have some points that I believe are applicable to our everyday life, and Hopefully I can get them in. I check my time here. I usually run over. Okay, I'm actually ahead of time. That's wonderful. That's a miracle in itself. <laughs> well, some of Charlie's practical points to ponder. Number one, like Jesus, we must get not give in to public pressure, but seek God's will and leadership in our life, and that's so very important. And uh, secondly, and, and public pressure is terrible. Remember, Jesus, they were trying to make him king because he fed everybody and he was a miracle worker and everybody thought how great he is and let's make him king. And that was not God's will. So public pressure can sway us. Uh, we see that in the political realm even today, all the things that are going on and how public pressure is pushing things good and bad both ways. Well, number two, Charlie's practical points to ponder is the Lord's timing is always perfect. We may not think so, but it is. We need to remember this when we're waiting on him to answer our prayer. And maybe he has, and we just haven't been listening to it. Well, number three of my Charlie's point, practical points to ponder, uh, the difficulties we face in life can build Christian character as it tests us uh, and, and helps us to grow and strengthen in God's word and God's service. And it tests us to see who will we turn to? Our money, our friend, or Jesus Christ? Well, my last one here is spending time with Jesus and the Bible. Studying, uh, uh, pray, studying the Bible and prayer, uh, spending a long time with Jesus. Uh, we call that prayer. And prayer is not always talking, it's listening to. Well, I love you, but even more importantly, Jesus loves you. I realize I've gone perhaps a little long, but... Anyway, this is for you because he is for us. And we listen to his small, still voice. I think we call that the Holy Spirit leads and guides us.
Well, as I said, I love you, but even more importantly, Jesus loves you. If you have a special need or prayer request, call our church. We have services at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock, and we're on uh, online uh, with our 11 o'clock service. God bless you, and you be a blessing to someone this week.